Hi, my name is Elsie Escobar, and I am the community manager at Libsyn, as well as co-founder of She Podcasts. I'm this week's guest on Metapod. You're listening to Metapod, where we unpack the web's most interesting podcasts and the stories behind them, hosted by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May. Hello, Kev and listeners. Hello, Wendy, and hello, listeners. Let's get straight to the action as we like to do here at Metapod. This is our 30th episode, and it's a special episode, the second in our Podcast Pioneers series. These episodes are dedicated to discussing the early days and firsts of podcasting with the mavericks and masterminds that have raised the medium. Yeah, our podcast pioneer guest uh, this time is Elsie Escobar. She's co-founder of She Podcasts, which is the largest network of women in podcasting. If you had an early iPod back in 2006 or so and synced podcasts from iTunes, you might have seen Elsie's podcast there. She did one of the very first female-led yoga podcasts back in the day. And Elsie's yoga class is still around. That's what it's called, if you want to listen. And funnily enough, the description sounds a lot like Elsie herself. Inspiring, spicy, fun, joyful, and uplifting. Elsie calls herself a podcast pundit, but we discovered that she's also a very dedicated supporter of independent podcasting and a very strong advocate for diversity in the podcasting space and utilizing podcasting to amplify community voice. Yeah, aside from yoga, being a mum and rallying the Sheep Podcast community, Elsie has a day job, like many of us. Uh, Elsie has been with Libsyn, one of the oldest podcast hosting companies for years, and you'll find her on Libsyn's community blog and podcast called The Feed. Okay, let's get to the action. Okay, start the tape. Hi, Elsie. Welcome to Metapod. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Good. So <laughs> you're one of our first podcast pioneer guests on Metapod. And in these episodes, Kevin and I try to get at the early history of podcasting and understand a bit about how things have developed since then. And we hear that you have a pretty unique perspective on things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I know. All through the grapevine. No. Okay. I, I know. Oh, my God. So, you know what? One of the things that I really love to talk about is, especially now since uh, I've been around for 15 years now, and seeing how it all started and seeing where I am now, one of the things that's so different than before is that now it's fancy. Like, now okay. it, there's there's all of this, all of these, fan, what I consider fancy people, like, You know, you have to, like, you have to get dressed up and you have to, you know, walk into a room and be really mindful of what you're saying. And there's a lot more of like the brand talk and there's a lot more money, like there's a lot more money. And whenever money comes into the scene, things start to change and it draws all kinds of people in, which is not as not really bad at all. But um, part of the differentiators is of when I started is that there really weren't, wasn't, there weren't very many people doing what I was doing. There wasn't very many people working in audio or even recording at home and trying to figure things out. And there was a a sense of like, just starting from zero, like people who were coming in with no idea Mm -hmm. how to record audio, no idea how to even connect things to a computer, how to edit things, how to record, like, there was zero understanding and we all collectively learned together and became what we are. Whereas now there's a lot more, I feel there's a lot more professionals coming into the mix. And when I say professionals, I'm not talking about the fact that there's a lot of independent podcasters who truly are professionals uh, at what they do, but they're, but folks are coming in with a level of understanding in audio editing, audio production, how to set things up that they've learned sometimes like in school Mm -hmm. and we didn't have that before. So fancy versus less fancy. Yes. (laughs) 
That doesn't sound so, yeah. Yeah. Yes, kind of. <laughs> Can you tell us uh, when and how you came into podcasting? And please tell us all about your claims to fame in podcasting, because I'm pretty sure that you have a few. Oh, my gosh. I started podcasting in 2006, in July 2006. Okay. Um, I, I came into the scene recording my yoga classes uh, because I wanted to record something. I wanted to have a show. That really was the reason I started because I wanted to have my own show. And I didn't know how to make it work. I didn't know how to do it. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to start doing something. I'm going to start recording something. I just <laughs> wanted something to record so that I could understand the process. And at that time, I was working as a yoga instructor full time. So I had a lot of classes that I was teaching. And people had asked me, they would come up to me and go, Oh, gosh, I'm going on vacation. I wish that I could take you with me. <laughs> I was like, Oh, me too. <laughs> but obviously, I couldn't go <laughs> with them. Um, and, and so I had the idea I was like, well, they want to take me with them. So maybe I can give them a recording of my class. And that's kind of where my mind went. That would be something that I can just, I can record it. And if this podcasting, whatever I'm trying here doesn't work, I still have recordings of my classes and I can just give it to them, not knowing how digital audio worked at that time or how you even transferred all that stuff. But I thought, Hey, why not? So I started to just test things. I started to test recording my classes first, just recording them. And then I started to get those, obviously make those audio files become a podcast by understanding, do I need to have an intro or an, entre or an outro to this thing? Is it just going to be my yoga class? What does this act, what actually is this? I have to find somewhere to host my podcast. How am I going to get the RSS feed? So it really became just like a, a, a jigsaw puzzle of mine when I started to do it. And it turns out that because it was such a weird thing that I decided to record, which was a yoga class of all things, um, I got a lot of attention. And because at that time, also iTunes didn't really have that many podcasts in there. You mm -hmm. basically could look at them all and you, you could scroll through all the podcasts like in one sitting. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, now you can't do that. But at that time you could. And and obviously the categories were also kind of ripe for being featured because mm -hmm. even in the alternative health section, there weren't very many people putting stuff in there. Therefore, my show was featured a lot. And I was the, the first um, audio, female audio yoga teacher that was in Apple Podcasts. That's one of my claims to fame. I, I, I'm interested, Elsie. <laughs> I... I, you know, I enjoy yoga. I go to yoga classes and I don't want us to go down a yoga rabbit hole, but I'm curious for me, seeing what the instructor is doing is a really important part. So how did you think about translating your classes into something that was just audio only? So when I taught yoga, I was not the teacher that demonstrated. So I'm a walker. So when I was teaching yoga, I walked around because if I'm doing stuff, people are looking at me or I'm doing it. I'm not looking at them. I really wanted to cultivate inside of my classes an opportunity for them to learn. And I was there to teach them, not for them to look at me to do it the way I did it. And so I already was walking around and doing a lot of, of verbal cues. So the way that I was yep. trained as a teacher was all around verbally conveying instructions to people through the voice and through my energy. So if I wanted to be like, everybody needs to get really tall, those, you know, you can see me do that and you can immediately start to get that hit of like wanting to move your body. So I convey that through the audio and to solve the problem of folks that maybe didn't know what the classes were. I, my God, I, it's still there, people. You can still see my website, but I actually took pictures of me doing every single pose. Okay. And so my show notes were a list of all of the postures that I did in every class mm -hmm. all together, like so that you could see everything. The entire thing was done in 
pictures. So there was like an there was an accompaniment to your audio with some visuals that they could look at while they were listening. Yes, to and they could go. They at first they would have to go into the blog to see yeah. all of these, and so I would say to them, "You got to go to the blog." Curiosity again, really. I mean, because no one was no one had done this before. How did you decide on length of time? So my yoga classes are an hour, hour and ten minutes, but that seems like an awfully long time to ask people to listen to something. Or would did you just translate it and say, "Let's just try the normal hour that you usually do, or whatever length of time that you do normally have." At that time, and again, the way that I set it up for myself was the easiest workload for me versus what the audience right. wanted. <laughs> so then, like, when I created it, I named it actually, listen to this title. You're going to, your mind's going to be blown by how creative I am. The class was called Elsie's Yoga Class. No way. Yeah. God. I mean, I am brilliant okay so anyway it was called elsie's yoga class but the way that it started it was elsie's yoga class live and unplugged i had that um, set up because i wanted to set the parameter for them to know that you are coming into you're kind of like coming into my already existing classes and i set up that i'm not teaching you the person that's listening i'm teaching the people that are in my class yeah, and okay. so i set that up. And I said, I'm simply recording the classes that I already have in here. And I had them different. Like I had a 90 minute class. I had a 75 minute class. I had an hour class and I would label them on my website, depending upon every, what everybody wanted to do at that time. And then I would also label them level one, level two. I don't yeah. think I had a level three class um, because obviously those are a little bit more challenging. And so I would amend those depending upon what I was teaching. But to your point, there were many times where I, I used to teach anywhere from 13 to 15 classes a week. Okay. So I would record almost as many as I could, because out of all of them, I ended up with maybe two that were usable because they actually lended themselves to an audio experience. Right. There were many times where either the poses themselves got a little bit too complex or I had to stop the class and actually teach. And that, and you needed to be in the room for that. Like, so I would do a lot of demos, like this is actually how you put your hands down or let's try to do a handstand today. And I would break down how to do that. And so there, were a, there was a lot of workshop-y type experience in my classes, which I couldn't really have in audio because that's dumb, <laughs> like, right? So that's how I figured it out. And I still, people are still downloading my class. I haven't published anything since 2013 and it's still getting anywhere from 200 to 300 downloads a day. I think it's because people are doing the classes over and over again. That's my thought. I'm pretty sure that you have some other claims to fame in podcasting. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> you are pushing me through there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yes. So I was doing the whole yoga thing. And in 2017, I was inducted into, into the Academy of Podcasters Hall of Fame, which mm -hmm. was possibly my... I, I am, I'm super humbled by that. And it was a highlight of my career in terms of podcasting. I think primarily because of what I mentioned before that I came into this uh, profession, if you will, without it ever existing before. And, uh, you know, when I started, I knew zero. And now at 15 years later, I knew, I know the intricacies of almost every single aspect of putting a podcast together from the creative aspect of it to the marketing, to the, you know, to, to the sales, to the management, to the building business, to the monetization, to so many different layers, because I've tried it every single one. I put my hands in it. And also I've been working at Libsyn since about 2008. And Libsyn is the, um, you know, one of the oldest um, podcasting hosting companies out there. And so I've had the opportunity to be able to to not only podcast, right? Because I still podcast, I'm still doing the thing, but I also have the ability to see what podcast hosting is like and mm -hmm. managing and helping podcasters get themselves out as well as looking at it from the perspective of data, looking at people's stats, seeing people's longevity, understanding like the cycle of creation for a podcaster mm -hmm. um, at a real deep level because I see it from so many angles. So something I'm interested in is 
I mean, promoting the value of your content is a very different job than actually creating the content. I'm assuming you have some very good insight on how that works for people, how it's difficult, how it's easy, and how that may have changed over time. Yeah, at first, I think because of what I mentioned before, that you could definitely read or see, you know, all of the podcasts and there was a desire for many of us to to consume content, to, 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 to consume all the content. It didn't matter if you were interested or not because you were part of, you were a podcaster and therefore you consumed other podcasts because you love them. You weren't really right. looking for very specific material. And therefore the value became this mixture between you your voice joining the collective, right? Because you had something to say that was unique to you and also for the collective to listen to your work just yeah. because you were putting it out there. So at first, the value in itself for both the creation and the and what it meant to get the word out was almost the same in some way. Everybody really worked collectively. Mm -hmm. Whereas now there's a little more, you have to be very clear as to why you're podcasting and why and what you want from the podcast, because there are many different layers as to how uh, the industry is expanding mm -hmm. and what you can make it almost, almost whatever you want uh, for your show, whether you want to be an audio pro and you want to be a producer of a podcast, and that's going to be your gig, man, you're going to be amazing. Or you just want to be a podcast host, you're going to be amazing. And it doesn't matter that it's your work or not, you're just going to do that. Or you want to create a podcast to give voice to your message with your community, or you want to make that a business. You can do and and everything in between. You can do all of that. Do you think anything gets lost in that happening with, with that? I mean, that, that community aspect you're describing of the early days sort of dissipating is that something that disappoints you or some people in the community or, or not at all I think there is an element of disappointment that comes up sometimes when I feel like particularly coming from a, a specific space we all feel a camaraderie with those that um, create podcasts on their own would I still consider myself like an independent podcaster where I do all the things. I, mm -hmm. I do everything. You know, I'll record it. I'll set up the thing. We get, you know, either set up a Skype or Zoom call, do a double ender, whatever it is that you want to do or do my own thing. I record my own stuff. I produce it. I edit, you know, I, I, all of the things I do myself. And there are many of us that do that. But interestingly enough, I, I'm just having a conversation with another really incredible person in podcasting who is also working in the business, in the industry, and seeing that there are now tiers that at times seem to be um, elitist in some ways because there is that, that element of in, industry and, and professional that's coming in that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. Many of us are, have been doing this for so long and we know the people that we serve and are making a living, um, establishing businesses, supporting other podcasters and all of these things. And there is a, and in different parts of the world, but now it feels like there are certain areas in the world that are demanding much larger pay that I'm like, I've never heard of this much money being paid to podcasts before. Um, just, to, or, just, just on that, sorry. I mean, what, yeah. what, what countries and what kind of levels of pay are we talking about? I, I, talking, I wouldn't even have an idea. Yeah, we're talking big, 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 big payments. We're talking like five figures for um, starting points for creating uh, a podcast, like just like a series for being hired to be an audio engineer for something or being mm -hmm. hired to be a producer for something and demanding that kind of pay because that's a minimal payment that you would get doing a craft such as audio engineering or, or audio producing or whatever, right? It, it depends though, because it's like everybody needs to be paid. Everybody needs to be paid for their time. But there are certain areas, I would say coastal areas, at least I'm talking from the United States, which is where I live, that demand, that merit you having to pay 
uh, that much money because you wouldn't do yeah. it any other way. And there are maybe other areas like maybe that's not, they're not the coastal areas like LA or New York or Washington DC or San Francisco, you know, those areas command more and are used to more entertainment industry and those kinds of budgets. And then you have folks that are in the middle of the United States creating nonprofits for uh, creating a, a work for nonprofit organizations or audio podcasts for certain types of communities that are not, they don't have the budget to pay that. Yeah. Right. So, and then you have the folks that are like working with the, the women that I work with for she podcast, which is my other claim to fame. Um, I have the largest podcasting community for women co-founded by my partner, Jessica Kupferman and I, and we've served so many women who are on their own entrepreneurs, or there are people who are either um, adding podcasting to their existing businesses, or they're creating businesses, um, serving uh, podcasts, podcasters, or other businesses with smaller type of um, services like maybe some voiceover work or social media or being able to edit certain uh, um, very, now I'm saying basic because it's maybe like a conversation between one person and another person that doesn't really merit a real deep edit where it's a storytelling narrative show that somebody's creating, right? Where uh, they want to hire an editor, uh, but they don't really have it to be forking out, you know, over a thousand dollars a month to be able mm. to sustain a podcast that's not making them any money. This is something that they're just doing, right? Um, or So all of those things I think are changing and we're trying to figure out whether it's a demand or if that's going to simply destroy the ability for the everyday person to get behind the microphone and put their voice out there and really claim that title of podcaster. I'm a podcaster. And yeah. that's when it starts to get like, well, what's the industry and what's the culture and what's a necessity and, and what's the, so there's, there's a lot of nuance in those conversations and they all are valid in so many different ways, but we just can't bulk it all together. You can't just say like, you need to be paid, you know, I don't know, X amount of money per episode. If not, right. you're being underpaid or how dare you charge somebody? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then it just becomes really like, I don't know. I mean, that's what I was charging because that's all that I can afford right now. Right. So it de it depends. Depends. Did, I sense I might be wrong here, Elsie, but I sense that the. You know, you've talked about how it's changed and it's changing still. Um, but those early days, there was a lot of kind of the hobbyists were involved in those early days. Do you kind of um, miss that kind of part of podcasting where it was just, yes, it was the Wild West and sometimes people didn't know what the hell they were doing, but they were doing it for the love of it and they wanted to share their knowledge on a particular topic, whereas now there is so much money involved and there are so many other things and that kind of hobby part of podcasting has gone and is sadly missed. Would that be accurate? Um. You know, I think it's still there. It's mm -hmm. still there. It's just not getting the coverage. And it's also being in some way, and this is my perception and it's my point of view, and it's what I fight against, that it's being discounted as not valuable. Oh, it's just those mm. hobby people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and and it's it's just those people that record in their, you know, garage. I'm just making, you know, generalizations around that stuff. I don't have a and garage. And the, well, there's so many, you know, but anyway. But the, <laughs> the point is that you you can't, with whenever you're creating a show, you never know how somebody got to where they ha they can get and what you really can do now with the power of audio. And there are some folks that are going to be creating masterful works of art when it comes to the audio experience. And it's going to be unbelievably amazing. And then there's going to be folks that are not, but they're going to create a conversation that is really impactful for a very specific audience that is going to, in some way, either inform them, inspire them, or simply make them laugh. 
But there is a sense that you have to be this pristine type of a, a, a podcast industry person and that you only count and you attach value to the download numbers, to how much money they're making, to how visible they are in the larger podcast platforms. And anyone who has a podcast that maybe has a smaller audience, maybe 50 people or 50, you know, 50 downloads per episode or something like that. And they are creating a, you know, something that is Zoom conversations with folks that really love a specific thing or something like that. And is then right. made into a podcast that it's like, ah, they're just, eh, right? And they are discounted when the impact <laughs> yeah. that folks, that voices like that have may not be fancy, like, but they really are impacting the people that they are reaching, including themselves, right? Including like, even if they podcast for two years, but they develop a, a sense of confidence and ability to speak behind the microphone and it, or, or an ability to manage tech in a way that they didn't before, the ability to record a show and edit audio. And that becomes a skill set that can actually help them as a stepping stone to whatever other ways they decide to work. Yeah. That in itself is valuable and it's quite an incredible experience versus what I'm feeling right now is that now there are, you know, university courses that are teaching podcasting. And I feel that there is a disconnect in the same way that our teachers go to school to learn how to teach. And you don't really know how to teach until you're in the classroom. Like that's when right. it actually really comes in. <laughs> like all of yeah. these things you learned, you're like, oh my God, that's kind of helpful, but it's not working here. And I think that the, the rough part is that the folks that are being called to be the experts or the, the creators of the curriculum are those that historically have worked in mainstream media, like yeah. the folks that have created you know, for public radio or radio or, you know, the NPR types of the words world, worlds out there are the ones that are that have the clout to yeah. be called in to teach at that level. But I challenge that because somebody like me who, uh, yes, I do have an MFA and yes, I do have an MA. And so, uh, you know, a BFA and I do have the credentials, if you will, in the in fine arts, because I, I was an actor in a different life. But at the, that, that's, but at the same time, though, I am beyond qualified to be able to teach at this level the nuances of what it actually takes to create a podcast from so many different perspectives. I cannot teach audio engineering because that's not yeah. my forte. I can teach you how to make a podcast regardless of where. In fact, right now, I mean, if we're talk, talking about being able to be where you are, I know how to make myself sound the best that I can, given whatever situation I'm in. I'm at my in-laws house now. I carried my, I know exactly what gear to take so that my audio sounds great. Um, where to set myself up, what type of microphone I need to have there. Is this going to be the type of microphone that I'm going to be using if I'm recording, like, you know, insert whatever fancy audio I need to get? No, but I am here and it sounds great, <laughs> right? Isn't that what it's uh, supposed uh, uh, to be? Are you in your in-laws closet? We've interviewed so many I'm, podcasts. Hosts. I actually am not because I have found that having the right <laughs> microphone can actually help you so much more uh. than having to be in the closet. So I have found that the mic technique and the right microphone can really help because being in the closet, what I have found is it takes away a lot of the color of my voice or the recording because it's so muted, I guess, the, the sound, you know, to some degree, it just kind of makes it a little darker. And I prefer to not be in the closet unless I'm really doing a voiceover, unless I'm like right. getting paid. You know, if I'm getting paid, <laughs> I'm going in the closet and I am making this the cleanest recording I possibly can, but. Well, there you go, people. Tips from Elsie <laughs> right there. Good microphone. Don't necessarily need to go to the closet or the garage. 
Elsie, yeah. what would you say is one of the most important historical details that new podcasters should understand? And maybe you could comment on if this is something that people do understand or not. You know, one of the things that a lot of folks don't quite understand and wrap their heads around, and I feel that there's a lot of, um, I think, philosophically, there's a lot of resistance to this as well, is the RSS feed, which is essentially the the the, the heart and soul of, of podcasting as we know it, that it is, you know, a series of audio files that are delivered via RSS feed, which is essentially in like in a, in a sequential order or in a series order. And when I'm saying series, I'm not talking about like chapter one, chapter two, I'm just saying like there is a, a set of them that are delivered in this fashion through the enclosure tag um, that you can subscribe to. So that's another thing too. And there's a lot of folks that don't really know that anymore because the platforms themselves have become so varied where you can consume the content. Um, Spotify for one is its own sort of ecosystem and folks don't really they, they're coming at it maybe for the first time getting to know podcasting and they are used to following because that's what you do in Spotify. And so they're coming into that expecting the same interaction as they would with music and they never think that there's anything different underneath the hood. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of podcasters who really work on YouTube and they cross post their podcast to YouTube. And there's many people who listen to podcasts on YouTube. And that's just the way it is. They would never think to go listen to a podcast inside of a podcast app. So I think the idea or the historical context of what the RSS feed was there for is lost sometimes in that description. I just asked a question um, on the Lipson social feeds because I run the community there. And I said, do you know your RSS feed? And there's so many people who are, it's just like deer in, in the headlights, right? They just open their eyes and they're like, I don't, no, I don't, right? So what's so, the case against it? I mean, do you, that, do you have to argue this often? Um, actually, the case against it is, is that they're this, the same issue here, that I'm explaining to you a concept that a lot of folks feel is not important because they're consuming where they're consuming. It doesn't matter. It's not my job. So a podcaster just wants to get their stuff out there. They don't care how it works. That's the new, that's like, there's a lot of folks that have that sense. I had somebody respond in a little bit of a snarky way to the question, do you know what the RSS feed was? And the person responded and said, that's not my job, that's yours. Ooh. And I was like, very interesting. And I just looked at it from the perspective of, that is a thing. Like there's a lot of folks that are getting in here that, that, that philosophically feel their content is the podcast. The tech is not, it's not, it, it doesn't matter. They don't care if it's via RSS feed that somebody's getting it. They don't care if it's, um, you know, via YouTube that doesn't really give you an RSS feed. They don't care that there are other places out there that actually don't create RSS feeds for you or they're not public or, or they're just a series of pieces of audio and they are calling it podcasts. So now there is that sense of what exactly is a podcast historically and what folks think a podcast is. And who's right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a, it's a philosophical, deeper conversation that's going through the entirety of the space, for sure. You have noted that you are one of the only female pundits, pundits in the podcasting space. Do you ever wish that you weren't the only one? And is it a tough job? Oh my gosh, you know, I have to say that I have to amend that now because when I wrote that description, it I was, it, I felt like I was literally standing in the middle of, and which is one of the reasons why I wrote that because nobody's going to give you a title. Sometimes you're going to have to claim mm -hmm. it, especially for women. I'm sorry, but it's like you, you, I could sit in the back and I, that's one of the things that I've done many times. I'm not somebody that leads from the front. I don't like get in your face and start to do this stuff. I'm happy 
doing all the things I do quietly in the back. <laughs> and that's fine. And I, I, the majority of my career in podcasting, I did that. I just was in behind the scenes. I did a lot of stuff that I never claimed, if you will, because I just was doing my job. Um, and then I started to realize that one of the reasons that there weren't that many, um, these voices weren't being heard is because folks like me weren't stepping up to the plate. So I was like, you know what? I have to stop complaining about there not being any women. I got to claim it and got to speak up more. So that was a challenge I put on myself. And that was one of the things I changed my bio to essentially move from a place of that. Um, given that though, in the past, I would say three years or so, there have been a, a, a lot of very smart women that have come into the scene. Kudos to all of us that are speaking up. Kudos to all of us that are really owning our places in the industry. Kudos to them speaking forward and creating the type of work that needs to be um, looked at. Who, who are who are some? Sorry, just in uh, on this uh, this particular subject, Elsie. I mean, who are some of the uh, the icons in in the kind of the the podcasting world on from from the from women. Yeah, I mean, I my, immediately I'm thinking of people like Kara Swisher and and uh, and high figures like that. Right. Yeah. 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 And again, see, I'm looking more to the folks that are like in the trenches doing this right. stuff. Um. So Juleka Lantigua Williams is one of them. The other one is Twyla Dang. Um. Barry, who runs Podcasts in Color on Twitter, is very. Um, a huge advocate for podcasting in a completely different expertise that is often overlooked, which is as a uh, as a community leader, as also a podcast listener. Um, there is Martina Castro, who is a huge advocate for Spanish speaking podcasters. Like there's just so many uh, women that are running like Danielle Corbett, who runs WOC podcasters. There's a lot of folks that are running communities. And I feel um, uh, and creating businesses that are standing on their own that are often overlooked. And those are the ones that are in the trenches yeah. that are working in it. Uh, and I'm not discounting Kara Swisher. She is somebody that I want, uh, she podcasts live. In fact, I'd love her to keynote and I adore her work and have been a huge fan forever. Again, she, but she's also really in it. Like she has really been podcasting for so long. Like that's why I love what she's doing because she's done it for so long. But there are a lot of other voices that are like, bubbling up and they're bubbling up from within yeah. and that's what i really love versus somebody coming from like hollywood and mm. <laughs> coming in and claiming oh they were the you know whatever yeah. you've talked about podcasting as a very powerful tool for finding your voice amplifying your voice to an audience where you might not have had the chance before uh, personal transformation. These are all very positive things. I'm curious, and I hope this doesn't sound the wrong way, but are there any dark corners of podcasting? And if there are, what's there? Dark corners. <laughs> I think that for a producer, especially one that's starting to understand how hard this is, like, I don't want to dissuade people from starting a podcast, but it's not that easy. Like, it takes serious commitment to be coming out and doing the thing. You got to really love it. If you're doing all the things and if you really don't like to do all the things, you need to find, you really do need to have some kind of resource mm -hmm. to have a team to support you because it's quite the amount of work. And particularly if you've set uh, 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 the type of podcast where maybe you don't have, you can't cut, I can't say cut corners because that's not it. Like a productivity thing. Because there's a lot of people who like, why don't you batch produce? Why don't you batch produce your show? Which is a great way to keep ahead of the game, right? You could totally do that. But if you have a show that you can batch produce, that's fantastic. But like my shows are not batched because I have, both of my shows are very of the moment type shows. We cover mm -hmm. things that are happening now. You can't batch produce that. And in terms of, um, I mean, other challenges that you might face it's, that are, I guess, more related to other people or the community of podcasting, are there any dark corners there? 
I think part of it is the accessibility aspect of it being in the spaces that have of influence. And I guess right now, you know, when we were talking about before all the fancy people came and with fancy people come structures that really work optimally to keep the fancy people fancy, if you will. And so being able to come and um, have the podcasting upper tier, like, and I'm talking about board of directors or investors or CEOs Mm -hmm. of companies or all of those folks also need to be able to reflect who is creating and consuming the content. And at this point in time, unfortunately, it's looking like every other industry. And it's disheartening in a lot of different ways because that diversification has not happened. And therefore, those doors are not as open. And I have yet to see somebody that is really, truly grounded in being able to understand that concept from the perspective of of, of seeing how different points of view can really actively uh, influence podcasting to completely keep expanding um, in a way that is... Uh, more equitable for everybody's voice to be heard. Do you think there are any um, genre types or communities or other subjects that are underrepresented generally? We've interviewed, for example, um, Wendy will probably be able to correct me, about six true crime podcast hosts. Oh, yeah. And they're incredibly popular and they're <laughs> often brilliantly produced. We've done a couple of comedy ones, but I wonder if there are any others that should be more or better represented overall. Gosh, there's there, you know, it's really weird because you're asking somebody who's obsessed with listening to podcasts. Mm -hmm. So I've listened to a podcast in almost every genre Mm -hmm. and there's a difference between, I think, represented, as you mentioned, in the charts (laughs) <laughs> and represented, right? Like just having them be because some of the larger categories are education. You know, education is huge as is religion and spirituality. Like those are huge as well. You know, um, lo- obviously the sex podcasts have also had a really huge following base. Um, there's a lot of the TV genre the, that covers TV shows that has, um, or movies that has been a seminal imprint in the podcasting industry from its inception. In fact, some of the biggest shows at the beginning of podcasting were TV show type podcasts. But now, all of a sudden, because Apple is developing independent content or creative content around their verticals or around some of the shows that they're putting out out for Apple TV Plus or, you know, and all of that stuff. Now it's like, oh, they're going to have a companion podcast for their shows. What a smart idea. And you're just like, oh, my God. It's been like every single show that I binge on, I immediately go find all because it's not just one podcast all of the podcasts that are reporting on that one show it's the most magical thing (laughs) if we could talk a little bit about she podcasts as a woman-centric community um what are the needs there that are unique and which have been fulfilled that the broader podcasting community has not been able to do and how has that changed and what what remains to be improved? Yeah, so I think part of, so She Podcast did begin specifically to serve women. And in the iteration, because we started in 2014, as it had, continues to grow and expand, we've expanded to include non-binary. And um, when we say non-binary, it's just folks that don't really fit into just the the gender the, the gender binder binary as a whole, um, and part of the reason why we expanded into that is because um, I feel since 2014, women's voices have expanded into places where they are heard a little bit more and represented a little bit more, but non-binary folks are not, 
And they are now starting, not starting, are facing things that women faced way back, right? It's the same sort of thing that they're going forward with. So being able to have a place where you can actually find support, find a place where you can voice um, you know, your content, the types of things that are interested, you're interested in is still a thing. So the reason that she podcast began was because of the feeling that we had um, in the other communities where we would ask a question and we were often dismissed um, or we got like these crazy technical answers or, uh, or answers that we didn't really ask for um, that made us feel a little like we, we constricted ourselves a little bit. And there was a lot more dogma, a perception of dogma. This is the way that you do things. This is a microphone that you use. This is the blah, blah, blah. And when we created She Podcast, the conversation became a lot lighter where we were able to address issues that came from not having what, um, I would say what fits fit fit in the gender norms that a lot of people took for granted, such as a lot of folks that started podcasting early on did have a special place like a garage or a man cave where they could go late into the night and record their stuff. And they already were a little bit more tech um, know-how, like they had a little bit more tech know-how and which was, that's fantastic. But for a lot of us, in terms of the way that we started podcasting, it's like the middle of the day. We don't really have a quiet place. Uh, I only have a computer. I only have $50. Like (laughs) There were a lot of little things where we didn't really have the ability to have the optimal experience of doing things. And we found whenever we showed this, um, these boundaries, like, like, I really only have $50 and I can only record on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. And I have a lot of noise outside. The answers were a little more dogmatic, like sort of like, why are you you podcast? There's no way you're going to be able to do it versus when we had we figured it out, man. And so I feel our community is always like, oh, I hear you. These are this is what's coming up for you. Got it. Okay. Let's all work together to make sure you can do the thing you want to do in the way that you want to do it. That feels great for you now. And then when you're ready, then you can do these other things. Or we come at it from the perspective of this is what worked for me versus do this. And so it started from that place where we're a lot more open and a lot more supportive. And there's a lot of, yay, yay, go, go, do it, do it (laughs) type of thing. (laughs) So as, as we get to the end of our discussion yes. here, Elsie, um, where does this all go? So you say you're you know, 15, 16 years into this now. There's the community we've talked about, you know, the entrance of the the, main, the mainstream media and the Spotify's and the Googles and everything. And we talked about the technical side of things. Is the concept able to change or is it very much still based on it's a periodical it goes through an rss it's all those kind of things that we've discussed or is there something else is it the emergence of people wanting to see something like us chatting now or something like that or is it or is there something that we're not quite seeing yet do you think i think it's all of it and i think part of the way the fluency of podcasting is you being able to you know the reason it came out is because podcasting was a solution to a problem that we felt we didn't have before, which is what getting your voice out there without any gatekeepers. So if, and therefore this technology was created and this is what we did. And that was around, you know, it's not 20 years, obviously, right around 17 years or so. And if you think about the way that we are moving into it is that we have now children that are alive that have never not known podcasters podcasting. It's been part of their lives their entire time. My children are, an ex, you know, some of those. So as we move forward, I feel that things will change and our ability as podcasters or the podcasting industry to be fluid and to affirm uh, new ideas is the thing that's going to keep the media moving forward. It's, gonna, it's not going to take away from the fact that, oh my God, you don't have an RSS feed. If you it's not going to take away. 
it'll allow them or us, all of us to continue to build on how to continue to get our, our voices out there without the gate, gate, gatekeepers. I will be an RSS girl forever in a day. Like I just, I, I love the functionality of RSS. I love it so much. But at the same time, I recognize that there are some challenges around it. We can iterate on it or we can simply die off by just like saying, claiming it and just letting it be. Uh, then I feel that, you know, Gen Z is going to push the limits of what creativity, creation, audio, video, media as a whole is going to be. And I can guarantee you in 10 years, it's going to be a whole other thing. Are we willing to take the ride? Elsie Escobar of She Podcasts and Libsyn, thank you so much for being here on Metapod. It's been a delight to talk to you. And I hope that you stay on the non-fancy side. Ah! And I mean that in the best way possible. I will. I promise. We'll do the we'll do the fancy, Wendy. You know we'll what I mean. Fancy, yes, 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 totally. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. You are so welcome. Thanks again to Elsie. We know she's very busy doing all the things, so we really appreciate the time she shared with us. You can find out more info about Elsie and She Podcasts in the show notes for this episode of Metapod. Yeah, and we like to hear your feedback on Metapod. So let us know what you think of this or any episode by leaving a review and rating where you listen. When you do that, you help us to get discovered by new listeners. So please, that would be great. So if you'd like to suggest a podcast pioneer or any other guest for the show, you can contact us directly via social media or via our website. That's at metapodshow.com. So this has been our second special podcast pioneer episode of Metapod. How about telling everyone what's coming up next, Kev? Yeah, so next time out, we're back to our regular episodes and our next guest is actually one of Metapod's first guests. That's Nick Hilton of The Town That Didn't Stare. That's for episode four, for those that can't remember. Uh, Nick is returning to our show to discuss his new documentary series, The Town That Knew Too Much, which focuses on the town of Cheltenham here in the UK where I live, which is also the home of British Spy. Nick has done some great work yet again. Uh, there's an original score for the story, and he's even added an audience challenge to the series. So if you're into espionage, intelligence, double agents, and the unusual characters that move in that world, give the town that knew too much a listen before our conversation with the show's creator, Nick Hilton. Indeed. Okay, I think that's it for this week, Wendy. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. That's it for Metapod this time. Thanks for listening. Metapod will be back soon with another unpacking of the web's most interesting podcasts. But in the meantime, make sure to subscribe at any of the usual places you find your other favourite podcasts. We'd hate for you to miss upcoming episodes, and we'd love it if you left us a review. You can let us know what you think of this episode by going to metapodshow.com. We'll see you next time. Metapod is produced by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May.